Hello and welcome back to the Alchemical Arts. Hope everybody is well out there and is ready to get stuck into some more pigment making experiments. Today what I'm going to be doing is continuing on some of my previous experiments with woad and indigo. And what we're going to be trying to do is take that to the next area of exploration, which is Maya Blue. So Maya Blue is a pigment from ancient times, from the Central America, developed by the Maya people and various other tribes in those areas, I assume would have played around with similar pigment ideas. It's really hard to say how long it's been in use, but it's, it's a very ancient pigment. It essentially consists of the extract from a local plant that has similar properties to indigo and woad. It has the indican chemical in there, the blue colouring component that you find in the leaves of the woad and the indigo plants. And in some manner they've managed to mix that with a local clay structure, um, which is um, apulagite, I think it's pronounced. Um, it's a sort of yeah complex clay structure. We'll talk more about that later as we get into it. But essentially what they're doing is they're sort of binding the indigo extract into the clay and heating it in some manner. And then the resulting blue, green, turquoise pigment that comes out of that is extremely stable, particularly for a plant-based pigment. We're talking still to today as bright as it probably was when it was first painted. It's resistant to acids and bases and hydrogen sulfide. So it's a very stable, uh, light fast pigment that you can get from the combination of this clay and the extract from the leaf. And I think it's got something to do with the clay has sort of a porous structure that embeds the color compounds into it. And when you heat it, it creates like a like a lattice of color and clay structure that's quite stable. Now, normally when I do these videos, I've practiced and refined my method for making the pigment so that we get a good result on camera and we go through the process. With this, almost all of my Maya Blue experiments over the last year or two that I've done tend to mostly fail for various reasons so I don't know how this is going to go but I thought I'd start a, a process diary essentially of my attempts and failures or successes in trying to make Maya Blue. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start by extracting some indigo from some powdered indigo leaf uh, and I also have the woad balls from last time, which I'll also do an extraction from as well. And we'll go through the process of combining that with the clay and figuring out the best methods for doing that and heating and processing and trying to develop the Maya Blue from there. So we'll go one step at a time. We'll try a bunch of different experimental avenues, a bunch of different recipes. Um, the literature online is kind of complicated and scant. Um, it seems like it's a lot easier to make the Maya Blue using synthetic indigo, but I want to keep this as traditional or as natural a process as possible. So first step today will be just to do a indigo extraction from the indigo leaves and then we will take it to the next step. So let's move on over and start doing some extraction. So our first step here in trying to make our Maya Blue is we need to make an indigo extraction so that we can use our extracted indigo to be fused with our, uh, our pure... So the first thing we need to do here is make an indigo extraction. So what we're going to do is I've got this little pouch here of powdered indigo, which is 100 grams, and I have a litre of water that is currently at about 51 degrees Celsius. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna add our indigo powder to this water, give it a bit of a stir, and we're gonna let it sit for 
two hours at 50 degrees. So if this starts to cool off too much, I've got the hot plate just to the side here and I'll add some gentle heating to keep it at the 50 degree mark. So what's happening is the warm water is allowing enzymes to act on the plant material here and break it down and extract out the precursors to the indigo and then what we're going to do is we're going to filter off the plant material and take the resulting liquid like we did when we did our woad extraction and we're going to add an alkali so either ammonia or calcium hydroxide and then we're going to add oxygen to oxidize the uh, indigo precursors to precipitate out our indigo which we will then let it settle and collect in a very long and painful process. So first things first, let's just add this powder, give it a stir and maintain the temperature for about two hours. So let's see if we can get some scissors here. Open up this packet. Powdered indigo should be relatively easy to find. I can't remember exactly where I found this, but it was fairly cheap online and that's, I think, why I got them in these pre-sealed 100 gram packets. So we're just gonna add the whole lot there. We'll get a spoon and we'll start stirring it in. Immediately you get this sort of like very chlorophyll plant leafy smell kind of reminds me of henna um, and we want to just give that a pretty decent stir because there's going to be some lumps full of dry very very dry indigo powder in there we want to make sure everything gets hydrated we might come back later and give this a bit more of a stir it's making for quite a thick liquid making sure it doesn't stick too much to the sides of the glass here either and this is not something you want to, once you get it mixed in, you don't really want to stir it too much because we don't want to oxidize the indigo. Um, because the oxygen is what causes it to become insoluble and we want to leave our indigo as soluble as possible in order to be able to filter out the plant material without losing our, um, our indigo, basically. So once I get this set up and mixed in, I'm probably not gonna stir it at all for the rest of the extraction process. Just adding a little more water to try and bring the temperature up. And we seem to have brought it up to about 49 degrees, which to be honest, that'll do fine. And I'm just gonna put a, oh no, we're up to 51 now, so that's good. I'm just gonna leave this now for two hours and we'll come back and do the filtering process. So this has been sitting for about two hours. The temperature has dropped down to about 35 degrees, but I'm pretty happy with, I think, the extraction that's happened here. And so basically now we have to filter out the gunk of the um, indigo powder that we put in there and collect just the liquid so that we can go through the next step of alkalizing and oxidizing to produce the solid indigo precipitate. And so to do that, I'm going to just run it through a filter funnel. So let's just have a look at the top of this because there's some interesting colors going on here and then I'll show you what I'm gonna do with filtering. So you can see on the surface there, you've got this sort of iridescent blue color, which is some of the indigo forming as it's been exposed to the uh, oxygen of the air there. Um, I just thought it looked interesting and I always like this process how you get these sort of metallic iridescent purpley blue sheens despite it being a green greeny black sludge as well. 
So all I'm going to do is I've got a filter here set up to the vacuum pump and this filter I'm just going to use paper towel because I imagine it's going to clog really quickly with the fine particles of indigo. So I want to just do a small amount of time, take this out, replace the paper towel, run it a bit more through, and I'm just going to collect the liquid down here in this uh, flask, and then we'll go through the next step. So after filtering, you can see some blue froth of the indigo has started to shift out here and up the top here because of the exposure to air the indigo has turned the paper towel blue and the surface blue which is all quite cool so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take this indigo pulp and add it back to here and see if I can get a bit more of an extraction happening and then we're going to go forward and process the rest of this liquid here and start to try and collect our indigo so the next step's relatively simple. I've just put the resulting liquid, which is starting to already get quite blue, onto my hot plate, which I've got a stir bar in there. I've got 50 mils of regular household ammonia, which I'm just going to add to it. You could use calcium hydroxide or maybe sodium hydroxide. I'm not entirely sure. And then I'm just going to flick the stirring on. By getting the stirring going, what I hope to do is up the top here have this come in contact with the surface of the air, which should cause the uh, soluble indigo to oxidize into insoluble indigo, which should precipitate out of solution, and we will collect that later on. I'm going to leave this for a couple of hours though. So we'll check back in in a couple of hours and we'll start to go through the painful process of settling out and collecting the indigo. So I'm back the next morning and as you can see here, it doesn't really look any different than it did before, but I can see at the bottom a very faint distinction between where the precipitate has settled out and where the dark liquid above is. So I know that my indigo has settled out overnight and I'm going to go through the process that I went through with the Wode project that you saw last time, which was very slow and painful, which is I'm going to carefully pour off this liquid. I'm going to add some hot water to the top, let it settle back out and keep doing that till I get a nice clear solution up here and a really easy to see indigo precipitate down the bottom here. And then we'll slowly pour off more and more water until we get it to the point where we have, it's easy enough to collect our indigo precipitate. This is a slow and long and arduous process, but it's ultimately worth it because we get a clear, clean result at the end. So bear with me and we'll keep working through this. So I have my indigo that I've collected here, finally, after many days of washing and drying and collecting and all that sort of stuff. And I've got this very dark, almost black powder here, and it's just under two grams of indigo. So I had 100 grams of powdered indigo to begin with, and I ended up with about two grams of pure extracted indigo, which isn't a great yield. And as you can see, this here is the container that I did my drying in, which I just um, evaporated in the sun, and I reckon I can still scrape a fair bit more off here. It's just really, really difficult um, to collect the indigo. Um, but we have enough here to work with. And then what we've got here is our Atapulagite clay. Um, which is a white porous clay. Um, I'll show you here, hang on. So this is the brand of kitty litter that I get locally, which as you can see, it says up here, this is the Atapulagite clay. So this is a pure clay. Um, you'll have to look around for this clay. There's another name for this clay in certain parts of the world. Um, but 
yeah, you're just going to have to look around for it. And I'll have the names of everything linked down in the description of this video. But it's hard to see here, but there is a few sort of like more orangey pieces. So here's one mixed in here. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just go through and try and find the whitest, like palest bits of this, this clay. And then we're just going to take our mortar and pestle and I'm going to do a rough grinding to begin with of this into a powder. And then we're going to take it out onto the marble slab here and grind it with the indigo and some water to create a paste. And then we'll move on to the next step. So the first step is just going to be to grind, to sort through this and find the nicest, cleanest bits and grind it up into a powder, which I'm just going to do that. And then we will discuss our measurements or our ratios of how much indigo to how much powdered clay we're going to use. And we will, yeah, get to the, the mixing of the two together. So I'm just going to take this, grind this off camera into a powder because it's not that exciting to watch me grind things in mortar and pestle. So as I said, I gave this a little bit of a powder. It's not completely fine, but it, it'll do the job. And as I was mentioning, you get some discoloration pieces within the, the kitty litter, which will just be impurities. You can see this sort of orangey one and these grayer, brownier little runs. I tried to remove as much of that as possible and keep just the cream colored um, little chunks of clay so that when I ground them up I get this fairly neutral color so I don't interrupt the color that we're trying to produce here. So I managed to find a few um, research articles on making Maya blue and a lot of them seem to recommend around about one to two percent indigo to the clay would yield the sort of bluey green turquoise color that we associate with Maya blue. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to measure out, I think about 10 grams of the clay. So let's take our, let's put a little crucible on our scales here. And one thing I should mention with the clay, although it's a natural clay, I do think it's still worth wearing a dust mask because it is a fibrous -y clay and you probably don't want that in your lungs. So let's measure out 10 grams into our crucible here. Which if we have 10 grams, we're going to need about 0.1 to 0.2 of a gram of the indigo. So, yep, we're at about exactly 10 grams there. So I'm just going to zero the scales and I'm going to very carefully grab some of the indigo. And this may be hard for these scales to register the weight. Hopefully it does though. So we're at 0.1. So we'll go a little bit more. 0.2, there we go. So 0.2, that should be enough for our first test run. So what we're going to do now is nearly drop all of our carefully collected indigo. Okay, so I'm gonna put the scales to the side. I've got my mauler, I've got my marble slab. If you had a glass slab, you could do that. I've got a little wash bottle here with some water in it. And what I'm gonna basically do is just lay this out onto the grinding slab here. I'm going to start to add a little water. And I just have a simple painting knife here. And I'm just going to start to work this into a paste. Adding a bit more water. And as soon as we start grinding, the indigo should start to disperse into the clay uh, and we'll start to produce blue. 
Right now the clay is a very sort of dirty sand color. I don't know if the kitty litter is just a poor quality and you can get a more pale white or if this is just the way that the clay is. That looks like enough water to begin with. I'll just get my mauler and we're gonna start grinding. I find the reason I'm doing this is this is gonna be the easiest way to really homogenize the indigo into the clay and bring everything down to extremely fine powder. You could do this all dry, but the indigo is such a fine, weird, dry powder that it's kind of hard to work with. And this is just gonna get a quicker and easier result. As you can see, it's already starting to turn blue. And we'll add more water as we need. As you can see with classic Muller work, we're getting a lot of junk building up on the sides there. So I'm just gonna scrape that off. And I think I'm gonna get a bit more water in there. So after about, oh, I'd say about 25, 20 to 25 minutes of grinding with the mauler. I've got a fairly smooth paste. I can still see that there are, and hear that there are still a few chunks of the clay that um, aren't completely ground to a fine powder. But as you see, it's this sort of bluish gray paste. It's quite a nice subtle color. In a way, it's kind of very similar to when we mixed the woad with the chalk and collected that, but maybe a little bit grayer. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this um, probably into some sort of ceramic dish or maybe even a glass dish. And I'm gonna put it in just my regular household oven at 190 degrees Celsius for five hours. And that should create um, well, it'll undergo some chemical changes and we'll discuss that in a moment, what I mean by that, but I'm just gonna collect this up, find a suitable baking dish, put it in the oven, probably cover it with another piece of glass or something like that. And we're gonna bake it for five hours at 190 degrees Celsius. I'm gonna leave it wet because I think it's gonna help in the process too. Um, yeah, so. So here we are after having baked the Maya Blue for about four and a half hours at about 190 degrees Celsius. And as you can see, we've got this sort of grayish blue, slightly purplish tinged uh, mass left after. There's a little bit of like burning discoloration. I'm not sure if the temperature was slightly too hot, um, but it can, it appears that like some of it has gone slightly turquoisey like we were expecting. Others have gone like this sort of purpley red kind of color. Um, but overall there's this bluish gray tinge. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give this a grind now and we'll have a look at the color after I've ground everything back up and we'll try and figure out where we're at, where we might've gone wrong 
and what we could do differently before we move on to some of the next stages of this process. But so far, this is definitely one of my better results. Um, I'll try also washing the pigment after I've ground it down. But yeah, we'll start here and we'll see how this goes. So I'll get, get the pestle, start giving this a grind and we'll see how that goes. So here's the pigment after grinding and as you can see we kind of got this grey blue slate grey kind of colour. Um, it's not particularly impressive to be honest and I took the liberty of mixing it up with a little bit of gum arabic watercolour binder and again you get this sort of dark sort of grey green blue that's you know it's nice in its own right but it's not it's not the vivid, clean, maya blue, turquoisey blue that I'm looking for. So, I don't know. I'm going to give the pigment a wash now with some hot water and see if that can clean anything out of it. Um, but otherwise, we're probably going to have to run a second attempt at this. And we'll also get started on the second approach using the woad balls from, you know, a couple of months, or from last year's woad ball project we'll apply to this. And if none of this really comes together or works, we're going to have to really change our approach. But let's give this a wash and see if that does anything. Otherwise, we'll have to go for round two. I'm going to stop this video here for today, um, as it appears that the process just isn't really yielding results. So off camera, I went and ran a second attempt where I ground it all up again and ran it through at a slightly lower temperature um, than the previous one and that didn't really yield much better results and I tried washing the pigment a few times with hot water after it had come out of the oven and definitely I was getting some brown murky sort of um, blackish water coming off and the the powder was getting a bit cleaner, but I think either the temperature is too high um, or the clay is not clean enough or what, like pale enough, or maybe my um, indigo extraction is also not clean enough or pure enough. So maybe I would need to figure out how to purify the indigo. Um, a whole number of different factors is obviously happening, which is leading me to that kind of very dull, bluish grey, slaty kind of colour, and we're not getting any sort of vibrant or even close to vibranty blue, green, turquoisey colours, and maybe my expectations are too high. I'll need to go back and look at some more reference photos of actual Maya blue. Um, who knows? There's a lot of different factors. But basically what I'm going to do is do a little bit more reading and we'll start on round two of this project next week. Uh, so what we're looking at for next time is I'm going to be doing a method where I take the woad balls from ages ago and we'll soak them to make an indigo solution which we will directly mix the liquid indigo solution with the clay in the attempt to sort of stain the clay with indigo colours um, so that when we take the clay out and oxidise it in air, it'll go blue and then we can do the baking process from there. Um, but what I'm going to do now is work on purifying the clay because I think that might be important. I think we're getting some colour discoloration from the clay. But I hope this was an interesting process and <clears throat> if you're willing to try this out there, I'd be really keen to see other people's results. Um, just, yeah, I mean, it's simple ingredients and simple ideas. If people thousands of years ago could do this, I should be able to figure this out, hopefully. But we'll stick at it and yep, catch you next time and good luck experimenting.